<laughs> well, 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 I know it's been a while since I've done a video, but we're back, baby. I think this is gonna be season two of the land vlog. And as you can see, I'm at my home here. I'm not up at the land where the videos are normally shot. The snow is melting, but I figured today would be a great day to finally hit record, try and get back on track and show you a new tool that I've been working on. Well, it's actually two tools, but one is physically here and the other one, well, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but I think both of the tools are gonna have a great impact on my land management and what I'm trying to accomplish up at our 80 acres that's about an hour and a half away from my home. All right, so over the, the past couple of seasons, I've done what the majority of us have done. I've used the classic Earthway spreader. Actually, this year I also picked up the Solo spreader. I've used it one time uh, to spread everything from you know peas to grain to wheat to all the fertilizer, but I'll be honest with you, as you can tell, I'm not getting any slimmer and it's a lot of work. We have probably between four to six food plots that we put in between a quarter acre and one acre size. And when you're only fitting, you know, 30 to 40 pounds at a crack and you got to put out probably, uh, you know, 1,000 to 1,200 pounds worth of material a year, this is a lot of work. So this particular model of drill right here is a John Deere Van Brunt. I think I'm pronouncing that right. If not, let me know below, but a John Deere Model B 20. So the 20 stands for the 20 row units that were here. There was 10 on this half, 10 that's on the other half. I'll show you that other half as I'm explaining how I got to this stage in a little bit. But this is what's considered a conventional drill. And what that means is that traditionally you would go through either plow up your field, follow it with a disc or just disc up your field, basically prep the soil by turning everything completely and then follow it with the, with the grain drill, setting your seed to depth, either pulling a chain behind each row unit or a culture packer behind it, and then setting the seed to soil contact. So by no means is the Model B, John Deere Model B here, a no-till drill. All the force of the planning wheels are gonna be basically from the weight of these dropping down. They're probably around 50-ish pounds each. I could probably get creative and add a little bit more spring pressure here, but traditionally on a no-till drill, it's actually gonna be the weight of the frame plus pushing down on the cutters that are gonna be doing it. Now, my plan is, if you've seen some of my other videos, is you know that I have basically beach sand for the soil type on our plots. So since I don't have a lot of armor on the soil or a lot of duff that's already built up from years of doing no-till practices, I'm actually gonna try this unit as a no-till unit. I'm just gonna spray off, I'm gonna drill right in, and I'm gonna see the results. Will it work? I have no idea. I'm definitely gonna do videos on it to let you know if it works or not. Let me know if you think it's gonna work or if you've tried it before, but that is my plan with this. So now let's get into how I got it to this stage. So the first thing is why even split a drill like this? Well, the overall width before, like I mentioned, was 12 feet wide, so kind of a bear to get down the road. And also, I'm not gonna lie, a complete bear to get even off of a trailer. I have that 34 horse tractor. Um, that has pretty good lift capacity. In the past, I've moved around a box stand that I built before that was pretty heavy. I don't know the actual weight of it, probably eight, 900 pounds. Was able to pick it up three, four feet and move it. Even when I had all the row units basically disassembled and pulled off this and the tongue that was on it, I wasn't able to lift it up high enough on the tractor to get it clear to the fender. So one would be transportability. Now at seven and a half feet, I can pull it onto my equipment trailer. And then the other big benefit of that is I can get it on basically any of our trail system that we have up at our land to all the food plots to make sure I can get in there and actually use this unit. Okay, as I'm getting this uh, prepped, I'm gonna be painting it this weekend, but I wanted to talk about a couple things about splitting this drill. And if you're looking at a drill out there that you wanna do this project to, and now this is a John Deere Model B. I've also heard that people also like the McCormick IH Model 10 and the McCormick Model IH 510 are also good units to split apart. Okay, number one, the first key factor that you wanna look for on a drill, if you're looking at one, especially like on these Model Bs, 
is going to be right here. Let me get this jack out of the way. But this is the drive wheel. So I took the cover off on this one. As you can see, this chain right here. This wheel, wheel is just simply attached through a mount that they have that's bolted on the back. But this wheel, as it's spinning going forward or as you're pulling it down, that chain right here is driving these main shafts, um, the main shafts that are on the unit, which is going to turn the seed meters right here. And imagine that the other length was on this side, there was a drive wheel on that side. And I imagine that back in the day, the engineers at John Deere did that so that you could independently pull this lever and drop one seed box while leaving the other one up if you're on an end row or you wanted to get around. But that is a key feature number one that you want to look for. Now key feature number two that you want to look for is independent small seed boxes if you get a unit that is going to have the small seed box. This is where you'd put your clovers, your brassicas, your small, you know, your small seeds that can go on top of the soil while your large seed box in the back would be more for your grains, your peas, and so on. Now, I say the key feature is that they would be independent because you want to make sure that this bar right here, this is the meter system for this small box is not, again, imagining that that other unit is still right here, is that it's not all connected. I guess it could be if you're one hell of a fabricator. I'm a hobbyist fabricator, so it's really just that this bar is separate than the other one. It's not so much a big deal that you gotta plug this hole. I mean, if you didn't wanna use metal, you could probably use wood or really anything that you want to do. It's just that that meter system isn't all 10 feet. It's just for the half that you wanna keep. Okay, key feature number three that you wanna look for, and this one cost me a lot of beer and a lot of staring at it. So I'm gonna to refer to this as the main shaft or the, yeah, we'll just call it the main shaft, but this bar right here, so, there's the two bars, this is what the row units are on, and this bar right here. Okay, as that bar turns from the metering wheel that we looked at earlier, that's what's going to drive these seed cups, okay? Well, if that bar was connected all the way over to the other units that, that's on here, again, you're gonna have to cut and fabricate something. So, after staring at this for a long time, and actually probably finally just saying, you know what, we gotta try it. Uh, I realized that this particular unit, they were separate. Now, I'll go outside and I'll show you. Okay, I guess before I get out there, this is, this is the, the feature of that main shaft that comes through. You see these two holders right here? That's where the bar system would slide out on this unit. Now, now we'll go out there. All right, so stepping out to the one that we have outside. Now, if you remember what that bracket looked like, you see these ends that are right here? Those two ends went into those bearings or just basically they're just pieces of metal that had a grease circuit in them filled with grease that these could spin on. Essentially, they were just there to support the weight of this. Again, this is just showing that main shaft going all the way through separate, that main shaft all the way through the small seed box, and then also the separate drive wheel. Actually, if I turn this, you see how it's turning the chain, and then that main bar is turning there. So yeah, this unit is gonna sit outside for a little bit, and there's another key feature uh, that I wanna talk to you about the next step of your build. Okay, I don't know where I'm at, and again, I haven't filmed in a while, so I'm a little out of practice here, but should back up. Before I got to the point where I decided, hell, I know what I'm gonna do here. You kinda need to determine whether you wanna make two drills out of one or one drill out of one. Um, and that's a big decision factor that went behind my thinking of to where I got to this stage, which we'll talk about here in a second. But when I actually did the splitting and finally uh, just went for it, all I really used was an angle grinder with a cutoff wheel. I did a little bit with a Sawzall but to be honest with you, it, this 
Actual galvanized steel is probably 16 gauge or like 1 16th inch thick. It's pretty thick stuff and um, the cutoff wheel seemed to work a lot better. I just measured off, went down, cut it, grabbed the pry bar and supported it up. And as luck would have it, it split apart. Okay, so like I was mentioning, uh, probably the biggest driving factor is if you get a drill like this and you wanna split it, is to figure out if you wanna do make one drill into two, or if you just wanna uh, split this down and make one drill out of it. Now, I bring that up is because there's, there would be a really simple way to do this with very minimal fabrication that you can make a shorter drill that you can get on a trailer and get through all your food plots with potentially not even a welder and just an angle grinder, you know, some basic hand tools, a drill, screwdrivers, basic stuff and get it done. Now that would be the easiest way to do it would be if you just wanted to make one drill would be to split the unit on the left hand side. So as you're looking at it, I guess the other way, flip this around. But if you're looking straight, straight onto the unit to use the left side of the John Deere Model B, use the side that has the bear, bearing carrier already on. This is, a, this is a factory mount setup they have in here. You could leave this complete row unit on, go out to the other unit, to that drive wheel, essentially, remove the chain that's off that drive wheel, take the couple brackets that are off the back, I think there's a spring on here, and that whole drive wheel would pop out, you could bolt it on, everything would be at the exact same height, and you would have a cut down drill in pretty short order. And as far as if you wanted to go that way, as far as filling the hole, if you didn't want to weld anything in or get a plate for it, you could honestly go to the big box store, get a small piece of tin or aluminum, bend it around, you could drill it, you could rivet it, you could cut a piece of wood in there, you could use some self-tapping screws if you want to do, and you could uh, make a plug for it and you would be off and running. The biggest downside of doing that is your wife better be pretty understanding because then you're going to have a piece like the one I have sitting outside right now, but you're going to basically have some yard art. Essentially, if you sacrifice one of the drive wheels, which is pretty hard to come by, and use it as a follower or a dummy, dummy wheel on this side, you've kind of rendered that other piece just for parts or useless, and it's really not going to be good for much unless you go and get another drill and then reassemble that one into a shorter one. Hope that makes sense. Let me know down below if it doesn't. Um, but I'm going to go over here about option number two that I went with so that I can make two drills out of one. Okay, option number two, a little bit more complex, but again, I'll preface this by saying I'm not a fabricator. I'm just a guy that likes to go out in the shop every now and then and, and play West Coast shoppers, cut up some stuff, weld together. I probably haven't turned a welder on in four or five years, so they're not the prettiest. Feel free to let me know below, but um, I think it's gonna work for what I got going on here. So essentially option number two, if you want to turn two drills, or sorry, one drill into two, you're gonna have to fab up a follow along wheel. The goal of that wheel is to simply just ride along to support the weight of the frame as that wheel is doing all the work. So to get to that point, what I did is I took the dust cap off of this wheel and measured up to the center mark of that spindle. I think it was somewhere around nine inches. Again, if you're working on a drill, you'll have to figure that out. Um, I went to the local welding supply uh, supplier. Here, I'll scoot out here a little bit. And I picked up some quarter inch angle iron because that's what this actual frame from John Deere was made out of. I think it's maybe two inch, two inch angle iron, which quarter inch thick material. I bumped out these brackets a little bit on each side to create some spacing right in here, because there is some nuts and bolts that you might need to get to right here someday down the road if you either need to tighten or change or replace a part. So that was a couple things to take into consideration. 
Then I just drop, bought a drop piece of two by two material and I had a hole saw that was inch and a half. So on that other drive wheel, the center of that spindle was nine inches up from the ground. I set my center mark at nine inches because essentially that would set the center mark of this spindle at nine inches if I got everything straight and squared and welded in correctly, which I think I did. So I drilled all the way through this piece. I slid a piece of material right here, inch and a half OD, slide all the way through. I think it's a one inch ID, which fits the receiving end of the weld on spindle. Got everything in there squared up. I measured off where I wanted this face plate to be to give me a two and a half or three inch gap, the same that's on that other tire, and welded it in. Added some bracing right there, and essentially the dummy wheel works as it should, and it rides along, um, but there's one thing that I'll talk about here that's a little bit different than the actual main drive unit. Now, the trickiest part about these egg tires is, and here's the one from the, the unit that's outside, is I was going to try and, and use that. The problem is, is it's the bolt pattern on it. So if any of you have ever measured backspacing on a tire or the bolt pattern, essentially it's going to be the distance between the center mark of one to the far edge of the other one, okay? So it's pretty easy to find a trailer spindle and hub assembly that's gonna have a five bolt pattern that's on four and a half inch spacing. The egg tires are five bolt pattern on five and a half inch spacing. So everywhere that I looked for a spindle setup, anything that's at that five and a half inch spacing was all six bolt patterns for heavier axle trailers and it, you know, I ran around and I looked. So if you know of a place that you can essentially buy these egg rims and maybe there's a weld on spindle kit for it, let me know. But it, I had to make some sacrifices because I didn't want to sacrifice the drive wheel off that other unit because then I would not be able to make that other unit into another drill. Clear as mud? Hope so. Okay, so what kind of a tire am I using? Well, like any good uh, hillbilly would have laying around their house, I had a old trailer tire. Um, we had an old equipment trailer that we had. We, we replaced the tires on it. And as you know, on these trailer tires, you can kind of go to the bigger box stores or even like the, the trailer supply stores. And you can almost buy the rim and tire setup for about the same price that you can buy the rubber setup. So I already had a 225R, wait, 225 slash 70R tire here. And this had the bolt pattern with a spindle that I could line up. Now the issue with this tire is, let's hope the camera's picking up, it's completely weather checked and I'm not sure if you can see it or if earlier in the video it looked like, hey, nice, nice leveling job there it's cut, but as you can see, this tire slants down quite a bit, and that's because on the actual trailer it was on, there was too much weight on it. The tire actually has um, about probably three quarters to one, in, one inch of slant built into it. For this application, for what I'm doing just between food plots, it's gonna work fine. The other advantage is I can pretty much go anywhere I want and I can get a new tire for this. Probably 100 bucks, 120 bucks. I could get a whole new tire and rinse set up. But since I already have this one, it's holding air. I'm just gonna buff and shine it. I'm gonna paint it and clean it up and, and let her rip. Okay, the last item that I put on it, and this is a wish list item. You don't have to do this if you're making one of these. But what I did is because you see a lot of them out there that are reusing and cutting down the, the standard hitch. I wanted to be able to pull this with my tractor, with the old side-by-side -side we have, or you know, other people might have a side-by-side -side or four-wheeler too. Mm. I wanted to be able to hook up to a unit like that. This unit is pretty light, but also I didn't want a big old hitch hanging off it permanently. So when I made the brackets here, I just added two dowel pins to support put the second one in that would take the slop out 
you pull both the pins off, you can remove this whole hitch. One thing that I scavenged off the main drill um, was I cut out and added the drop bracket here because on the tractor, it's way down. Um, if a side-by-side -side might be higher, you could move this up. But again, it would, it would allow you to level the drill to get it set up. But to get it set up. So if you can remember way back to the start of this video, I talked about tool number two that I wanted to use to kind of continue my, my habitat journey and to continue my improvements on the land. So I'm guessing you're a lot like me if the old Google machine got you here, but I've done the, probably the same research that you've done to get you landing on this page. But I've looked at all the food plot videos on YouTube probably twice. I've looked at all the product reviews, blinds, um, cameras, you name it. I've done all the bright, shiny, fun stuff to try and do deer management or looking at, the, looking at deer, how to improve the land. But I've never really kind of questioned myself to stand back and be like, hey, what the hell am I doing? So I decided tool number two that I'm going to use is I signed up for the National Deer Association or NDA's Deer Steward Program number one. Now, this program is an online program. This isn't endorsed by them. In fact, I've never been to an NDA meeting. The closest thing I've got to, from them or closest thing I've been to a meeting is getting their magazine and when you sign up to be a member, you get one of these cool stickers. And I want to be able to put this sticker on my truck or my drill so if you ever see me at a, at a gas station someday, you can be like, hey, I bet that guy likes to deer hunt. But in all seriousness, I signed up for it for my tool number two that I'm going to use is because I want to be able to create my own comprehensive plan. So I'm already kind of 15 hours deep into the... Um, the program right now, I think it's great. It was 200 bucks. Um, I've spent way more than that on dumber things for deer hunting um, that might or might not help. But what this program does is it brings you through kind of the ecology, the biology, the management side, and it gives you kind of the fundamental aspects of how deer move, how they interact, their feeding patterns, um, why they might do certain things. And basically it just kind of builds the foundation. So if you wanted to go on to the next step, which would be deer stewardship number two, which is kind of my, my ultimate goal. But before I get the cart way in front of the horse, I want to go through the program first. Um, like I mentioned, it was pretty affordable. See if I like it, see if there's some value there. So far it's looking pretty good. I think the deer stewardship number Two, it's a pretty good chunk of change, but that is a field day. And then it's also, I think, a three or four day course that goes through the cornerstones that uh, QDMA, originally, now NDA, National Deer Association, was built on. Kind of the principles of herd management, hunter management, um, geez, habitat management, and I should probably know the, the fourth one, but I don't off the top of my head. But essentially, there's a field day. You can go through that and what that field day would give you is towards the end of it, if you use the building blocks in, in uh, stewardship number one, apply the steward number two, is it would give you the fundamentals that you need to write your own habitat plan and that's what I'm looking to do. I want to be able to create the own plan for my own 80 using my own noodle that I didn't have to get from a big knocker because like anything, I feel like if you do it yourself and you take the time to research it, you're gonna have a better understanding and grasp of what the hell is actually going on and, and what you want to, what your goal actually is. All right, well, I should probably get back to my project here, get it jacked up and get it primed and painted. I'm actually using the egg enamel paint, which is gonna take a while to uh, cure, but I'd be interested. Let me know down below if you've done any of the deer steward programs, if you liked them, you didn't like them. I'm going to do a follow-up on that, but more importantly, I'm going to do another follow-up on this drill. If you have any questions on it, let me know down below. The next video that I'm going to do is going to be 
Once this thing is complete, is going to be how the metering systems work. I'll go through calibrating it. Um, and then also we'll get it out to the field and do some test runs with it and kind of show the progress of the food plot. So if you see a video right around here, it's because that video is done and you should click on it next and watch it. And if you don't see it floating around right here, it's because it's not done and you should just click the uh, subscribe button and then you'll know when it's done. Fair enough. Okay, team. See you in the next one.